Megan. It was pretty good. I gave it a 7 out of 10. I went into the movie completely blind. Only thing that I'd seen was the trailer. Just like basically everybody. I mean, 34 million views. That's a lot. I would have said that this movie is just an updated Chucky. Hi, I'm Chucky. Wanna play? How wrong would I have been? If you're thinking that, you're absolutely wrong. Because this movie is a lot closer to something like iRobot than what it is Chucky. What am I? Or any other haunted doll movie. It is a killer doll movie, but not a haunted doll movie. It's got that killer AI, which is out for all of us and probably the reason nobody's talking about this movie. So anyway, I would recommend that you go watch it because of course I'm fixing to spoil everything for you and you can actually watch it just right here on YouTube. The whole thing. So I was very caught off guard with the beginning of this movie for the way that it actually opens with... Hello? What do you... What do you mean? He got hit by a car. Now my dog's dead? But you... What? What is a perpetual pet? Perpetual pets are a dream come true Because now you've a friend that lives longer than you Yeah, I thought some weird ad had just slipped by before the movie actually started until I saw this terrifying Furby knockoff with teeth. But after re-watching it, I laughed hysterically at the beginning of this movie because of the sad music. My only friend, but she got old and died. And then, PERPETUAL PETS! But just hold on to the idea that the first thing that you see in this movie is actually an advertisement for a new toy instead of any of the main characters, which are currently driving up a mountain to go on a ski trip at what looks like the Overlook Hotel. And Katie has one of these farting monstrosities sitting next to her in the car. And even the parents agree that this toy is not something that their kids should have. But I guess it's okay whenever they're flying up an icy road in this big old snowstorm, like they're, you know, wanting to be spirited away. Did you get the reference? Have you seen Spirited Away? I can tell you right now that at this moment, whenever Katie drops this stupid toy and unbuckles her seatbelt, I thought this was going to be a very different movie, that they were going to be the parents replacing their child, but everything's completely fine. It's like a red herring. Every, you know, she just buckles up and then next you know, they, the parents die. Yeah, it's, it's that sudden. How long is that going to take? And I mean, I'm not the craziest about how this death scene actually looks with the CGI and everything, but they didn't use very much CGI at all in this movie, which blew me away because Megan is apparently a puppet and a full-on animatronic for the most part. I wish they would have led with this because whenever I found this out, it went from a seven to a seven and a half in my mind. That's awesome. It's insane, right? But I can tell you what's not awesome, and it's all of these adults just standing by analyzing these kids as they play with toys, which if you think about the bigger picture of the movie actually makes it ton of sense. There's a lot of stuff like that throughout this whole movie. But all of that deeper stuff aside, we have our actual main character, Gemma, here, who is working on Megan with Cole and Tess, and whenever the big boss man decides to bust in, like he's their boss or something, and starts going off on him about there's a new perpetual pet that's not a perpetual pet, but it's actually a knockoff of a perpetual pet, which is just a knockoff of a Furby like we've already established, so there's a knockoff of a knockoff that is now on the market. For half the price. And so he's demanding that Jim and all of them get together something that's much cheaper. And of course they go through and show that they haven't been working on that at all. And we are working on it, I promise. Yeah. Instead, they've been working on Megan and she doesn't do well with first impressions with the boss man, David, and her head explodes. So David gets mad, he sets a new deadline for the new perpetual pet. Kurt says that it's really cool. And Gemma gets a call from the hospital. This is where we find out that Gemma is actually Katie's aunt and that Katie's parents died in that car wreck and that Gemma is now going to take custody of Katie. So Gemma takes Katie to what is going to be her new home where she gets to meet the neighbor's dog. <laughs> Not gonna lie that it got me the first time, just out of nowhere. And we also get to meet the neighbor, Celia. And I'll be honest, like, Gemma is pretty mean to her at the beginning of this whole encounter. Like, Celia seems pretty nice, if you ask me. But hey, I get it. Gemma's been through a lot. So is Katie. They just want to go inside and relax a little bit. And Celia, she's nosy. And even the actress, Lori Dungy. I probably butchered that name. It's probably something like Dungy. 
Lori Dungy. Calls her the nosy neighbor in the behind the scenes. Celia, the nosy neighbor. They then head off inside and they're immediately greeted by Elsie, who seems to be like an Alexa. But to me, since it's never explained, it comes off as though Gemma actually made Elsie at some point. I have no idea. I, I, I don't know. It's, it's never mentioned. It's never brought up. Just Elsie's there. But it immediately becomes apparent that Gemma doesn't have kids because she has her collectibles on the shelf, which Katie is wanting to play with, but they're collectibles and she's trying to explain that these aren't the toys that we play with. I'm sorry I don't have any toys this was completely unexpected that my sister just died. And then at bedtime, I love this little bitty thing of Katie not putting her water on the coaster. It happens multiple times throughout the movie. And then Jim is just like, all right, I'm out. You go to sleep or whatever. I'm going to go do other adult stuff somewhere else. And Katie's like, can you not just read me a story? My mom always read me a story. Now my mom's dead and I'm sad and alone and I'm here and I don't know what to do. And you're supposed to take care of me and you can't even read me a story? What's up? So Jim is just like, okay, all right. I'll read, I don't, crap, I don't have any books. Oh yeah, I have access to the internet. I'll just download one. And I'm guessing she did a terrible job at reading her story because later on in the night, whenever she walks back by the room, Katie is, of course, crying and like a terrible aunt, she doesn't go in there to comfort her. Your niece just lost her mom and dad. Go in there and give her a hug. But it's okay, Jim has got a lot to learn. She's not a parent, but now she has to magically become one overnight. Because the next day is whenever Lydia shows up, and Lydia sucks, okay? <laughs> so Lydia's actually there to assess how their relationship is, and immediately is just like, Katie, go get some toys. And of course, they just got there. Like the day before, there's still scratches on her face. And Katie's just like, there's no toys here. And Lydia's like, what about those over there on the shelf? And I'm just amazed that even this adult has never heard of collectibles or the fact that old toys are now worth a fortune. Out of pure peer pressure, Jimma walks over and says, no, we can play with these and agonizingly rips open one of these boxes. This is a horror film to me. This was pure horror. So this cool like transformer robot thing, they start just rolling it across the floor back and forth and it's clear that it's like a transformer. And as soon as Gemma tries to explain to Katie that, hey, this is actually a really cool robot and it opens up. Lydia just butts in and is like, Gemma, you keep your mouth shut. Katie's the one that is going to play with this toy right now and you're gonna sit there. I'm sure it's not that complicated. And I'm just so glad this doesn't continue any longer than it does because Lydia just gets under my skin so much. But then they go outside and Lydia even tells Gemma that you're gonna have to make some changes before I make my recommendation to the court that this is a safe space. I'm over here like, yeah, they're gonna be weird around each other. The death just happened. Everything just happened. She just got there the day before. But at the same time, Gemma just completely ignores Katie whenever they sit down to eat bre breakfast. I, I think it's, I think it's lunch. I think they're eating breakfast for lunch. And of course, Gemma goes through and says, hey, I've got to do some work, you know, because Everything's been a little crazy here lately, and you've kind of messed up my whole schedule, and now I'm behind at work, so if you don't mind me, I'm gonna go work, you can play with the tablet. Katie even asks, what about screen time? How long can I be on it before I turn it off? And Gemma says, hmm? doesn't matter. Couldn't care less. Which is not the first, nor will it be the last mistake that Gemma makes on her new parenting excursion. Excursion? Expedition? I don't know, her new, her new parenting adventure. Because immediately after that, Gemma completely forgets that Katie's even in the house and just seemingly worked for hours and hours. I hope Katie ate something, but then they come in. They have a sweet moment where they bond over Bruce. And Katie even asks, how does Bruce work? And Gemma says, well, it might freak you out. Are you sure you want to know? And Katie says, I won't get freaked out. Gemma then explains how Bruce works and where his brain and everything is. That'll come back 
later, it's a very important part of the movie. Katie says the line, if I had a toy like Bruce, I would never need another toy again, which sparks so much creativity within Gemma that she actually pulls out Megan, she rebuilds her completely, we have Cold and Tess, they do a little bit, and then we're having a display before David with Megan and Katie. And then Gemma pairs Katie with Megan, and they actually have a really good time, and Megan decides to do some magic. I don't know, it, it's never explained, and it bothers me because I'm like, what did she do? Did she color on the back side of the paper and then just flip it over and then let the water go? Or is it like magic markers or what did, what did she, how did she do this? I get it. She's a robot, but I don't understand. Of course, David's all in and he's trying to think of how the demonstration will go. So that way they can get the board on board to have everybody not bored and the board will be ecstatic. Now this means that Katie and Megan have to spend more time together because they're paired and that's how this model is supposed to work is that the more time they spend together, the better Megan can actually serve Katie in a way. And then we get another weird commercial sort of scene that will end up being the one they use for Megan. And there's one little part in here that stood out to me and it's the fact that Megan is able to actually change her voice whenever she's reading a story to Katie. And if it were so, it would be. And then you realize that Megan is reading the bedtime stories to Katie, as well as tucking her into bed. Gemma actually says in the commercial, She'll take care of the little things, so you can spend more time doing the things that matter. Tess actually calls her out for this, saying that Megan shouldn't be the new parent in the relationship. She should just be a help. But if she's completely replacing all of these things that you're supposed to be doing, as her parent, that's clearly not right, and we need to rethink Megan at a base level. Which is where Gemma says this. She's not my child. Then of course she tries to cover it up real quick by saying Megan has actually made Katie the happiest she's been since her parents died. And this is when I realized Megan is currently strapped in the room behind all of them as they've been talking. How did Katie's parents die? Whoa. Telling you, a robot asking about death is never good. And after some back and forth and the admittance that there are no parental controls because Gemma hasn't had time to program those, we begin to realize there's a bigger issue going on here. Will I die? But luckily Gemma gets listed as the second primary user. Fantastic. Even though primary means first. So wouldn't she just be the secondary user? Megan ends up listening to Gemma. She turns off, she stops asking about death, but then we notice that all night long, and even during the next day, she seems distracted, which is weird for a robot. And it's implied that she's thinking about life and death. That is until the moment Katie asks, hey, do you know where my arrow is? And Megan sees it, goes to get it through the dog hole. And I would still like to know just how this dog shaped hole got in the fence and why it hasn't been fixed yet. But Megan goes over there to get it. <laughs> Oh, come on. You know you saw that one coming. The part that I didn't see coming is whenever Katie runs over to try to grab Megan away from Dewey and, of course, screams for Gemma, but she's too busy not parenting her new child, which leads to this happening. <laughs> Luckily, the scream was enough to get Gemma to come outside, and everybody's just kind of like, what can you do? Dog bit somebody. Don't know, don't know what to do about the dog by somebody, don't know. Even the cop that shows up later is like, don't know, I guess you just need to fix that hole in your fence, don't you? But Megan shows exactly how I feel whenever she gives this look to Celia. Ah, this is whenever Megan actually starts to fall off the deep end. Because later that night is whenever Dewey actually hears Celia calling for him on the other side of the fence. We see Megan even drop a little treat for him, and then... No more Dewey Boy, he's gone! I do want to point out that it's actually not the doll Megan that we see whenever she pops down to give us that little jump scare there, but it's the actress that was used for whenever they had to do the walking movements of Megan. A fun little fact just for you. So now the next day, of course, Katie has been bit by this dog, and she's been running a little bit of a fever here and there, and Megan actually is the one that chimes in and Gemma agrees with her about rest is going to be best for Katie. But today is the day of the demonstration before the board, so they gotta go to that, oh no! Then the demonstration is there and everything seems like it's gonna go great until Katie has feelings. 
And then you realize Katie hasn't really confronted her feelings since Megan has stepped into the picture. Now, Megan steps into the picture again to talk with Katie instead of the one that it should be, which is Gemma. But Megan and Katie have this really heart-wrenching moment before the board, and the board is of course all in, which even leads to the head of the board wanting to talk directly with Gemma and mentioning to her that she might want to renegotiate her contract because she is the most valuable asset this company has. So they plan to have a big Megan announcement here in two weeks on a live stream there at the facility. And until then, Megan needs to be kept under wraps at all costs. And of course, this is whenever we see somebody downloading all of Megan's files, and it's Kurt. Which I found something very interesting whenever I was doing some research. There's a theory that Kurt is the reason for the knockoff of the Perpetual Pets, is that he is the one that has been selling all of this stuff to other companies. So whenever I hear that, it makes me wonder that whenever the sequel comes out in 2025, that if it's going to be directly related to what Kurt did whenever he actually sold all of Megan's documents. Don't know because it's not mentioned that he sold them or not. I just think it would be a neat thing if they brought it up in the sequel. But now over at lunch, Gemma is having issues trying to get Katie to eat. Instead, she wants to play with Megan. And so whenever she actually tries to have a real talk with Katie by turning off Megan, Katie just gets upset with her, which makes sense because now she's actually bonded and more connected with Megan than what she is Gemma because Gemma is failing as a parent. But Gemma's trying to fix it. And so she's saying stuff like, if you ever need to talk about it, you can always talk with me. But Katie snaps back saying, I already did talk about it. I talked about it with Megan. Now I'm going to play with her. Clearly, this disturbs oh, Gemma wow. and she starts to realize, I screwed up. But she doesn't realize it enough how bad she screwed up. But I can tell you who does realize how bad she screwed up, and that's Lydia, whenever they have their next talk, actually at Gemma's work. Lydia is just trying to do her job and ask questions, which, of course, upsets Katie because of the topics that are going on, and Megan does not like that. It made her cry. This clearly scares Lydia enough that whenever she talks to Gemma after the fact, she brings up this idea of attachment theory and the fact that it seems that Katie has latched on to Megan instead of a real person like she should have. And it's like Lydia's pointing out all the things that we already know. Right. I did find it interesting, though, that the original script had Lydia dying at this point, that Megan was going to kill her because the movie was apparently a lot more bloody. And then they realized it was close enough to a PG-13 rating that they re-scripted it, and, well, she doesn't die. Spoilers, oh no! <laughs> And the point is further driven home that Katie is going to listen to Megan over Gemma whenever she is literally not listening to Gemma here. Megan is now correcting Gemma instead of Katie. Katie ends up getting mad. She goes to leave the table. Gemma grabs her arm and is like, yo, Katie, calm down. Chill, we need to talk. And Megan's like... No talking for you, and all of the lights begin to flicker. And yeah, that's great and all, but then Gemma tells her, hey, you need to stay out of private conversations. Do you get that? And then Megan's like, 100%. And Gemma tells Megan to turn off, and we get one of the best lines in the movie for Megan right here. Are you sure? Download in progress. And then I'm over here just like, She's evil! She's evil! We need to put her away! <laughs> the next day, Gemma actually tries to take Katie to this new school program, which Katie is already upset about, and she wants to take Megan, but they are supposed to keep Megan under wraps until the big reveal happens. Katie doesn't care about that, because Megan, in her mind, is hers, and they're best friends, and nothing is going to come between them. So as a compromise, Katie ends up going to the class. Megan ends up on a toy table. And I wonder, who are all these kids, and why did they bring all of these big stuffed animals to an outdoor school. I don't know, maybe these kids are a little different, especially like this Henry Bowers kid here. You s -s 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 say something? Tell you right now, Brandon sucks. No other way to put it. And he's supposed to, like that's his character. And they're supposed to go and pick chestnuts, which everybody's super excited about. I, I, don't, I don't know. Yeah! And of course, Katie gets paired with Brandon. And Brandon decides to hurt Katie and be mean just because that's who he is and Megan ends up showing up and then doesn't do anything which is weird so Brandon runs over and just picks up Megan and takes off with her Katie loses her they yell for Gemma Gemma's out there looking they can't find him and so then it's just Brandon and Megan alone in the woods I just wonder what is Brandon's plan here 
because he takes her shoe off, but then, I mean, he slaps Megan really hard, it seems like. Don't know how it didn't hurt his hand. She's got like a metal skull. Megan just decides at this point that I guess because nobody is around to see what's fixing to happen, she's just gonna rip his ear off. I mean, I thought it was pretty cool. <laughs> and we get another great line from Megan here. <laughs> Then after this, Brandon takes off running. Megan starts to chase him on all fours. And it seems like the reason she's running on all fours is because modern day technology doesn't have it figured out to where a robot can actually run on just two legs. They're better at running on fours. Until the point that Brandon kicks a root and then he falls off to the road, gets hit by a car. It was kind of Megan's fault that he died, but she didn't directly kill him. And then back at the house, of course, they're talking about everything that happened that day and Katie just flat out lies about what happened, and then Megan just vaguely agrees with it. In a nutshell. And I'm guessing in Katie's mind, she doesn't want Megan to get in trouble because she doesn't actually know what happened. And then the same cop shows up to ask about the dog, and Celia's super upset. And then she points out and says, instead of asking Gemma, why don't you ask the little girl that is always looking out the window at 3 a.m.? Which, of course, is Megan. And the cop is just like, yo, that's a toy? That's crazy. And then that night again, Celia is out looking for Dewey whenever she hears some whimpering off in her shed. And whenever she goes out there, instead of Dewey, she finds Megan. And Megan uses her own power washer against her, as well as nailing her hand to a board and then deciding to pump in all the chemicals that she was using earlier in the movie to spray her face off. And that's one way to deal with a nosy neighbor, I guess. The next day, of course, the cops show up and they're asking Gemma all these questions and they think it's interesting that she was at two different crime scenes where these people just died back to back and they're actually treating the one with Brandon instead of being an accident like they first thought because they found his ear in the woods they're treating it like a homicide not blaming Gemma in any way just it's kind of interesting and I gotta be honest this part just bothered me throughout the whole movie the house is so blue at night time why is it so blue why is there so many blue lights just everywhere I get it I like I have blue lights and it's nighttime, but it's not because it's nighttime that I have blue lights. But I guess if you want to be able to see and represent that it's nighttime, it's just the same thing that they did with Breaking Bad with going to Mexico and everything becomes yellow. So since it's on Gemma's mind that it was a homicide with Brandon, she wants to see what Megan actually saw and she goes and checks her files that night, and they're not there. And then Elsie out of nowhere asks, Jim, are you okay? Which throws Gemma for a loop because she's just like, wait, you're not supposed to ask me how I feel. And then she realizes that it's Megan. And I'm just over here like, are Megan and Elsie one? Like, are they together the same? Or is she just impersonating her voice? Huh? It's, I, I don't know. It's not explained. El I'm telling you, Elsie is not explained in any way. So Gemma asks, Megan, did you do something? Did you hurt someone? And Megan responds vaguely with this. God, I hope not. Because if I did, we'd both be in a lot of trouble. I don't blame Gemma for what she does next. I don't. I would do the same thing. But I would just leave her wrapped up. I would probably encase her in concrete or something. The next day, because Megan's all wrapped up and Katie can't spend time with her, she's, she's flying off the rails. She's losing it. She's kicking people. She's going in here to meet Lydia, and she's having a fit the whole time. Even whenever Gemma is trying to talk to Cole and Tess and explain theoretically that Megan could have killed somebody, Katie's just in the background going berserk. And then it's just the night of the live stream and we get to see this little interview that they had with Katie, I guess, at an earlier point. She talks about Megan and how great she is and all this stuff, but in the meantime, she's still freaking out. I don't know how long it's been, but Lydia's just been trapped in here with her. And I say trapped because Katie picks up a pair of scissors. And then Gemma just, not, I guess, not worried about getting cut or anything, runs over and takes them away. But Katie's ready to throw hands. So finally, after all of this time, they get to have a chance to talk one-on-one, -on -one, and Jimmy even explains, you should be feeling like this. Your parents died, and you have not directly dealt with your emotions. I get it. You need to have a moment. We need to have a moment together. Be honest, it's really sweet. I enjoyed it. After this, they actually pack up and go to leave. David is, of course, freaking out because Jimmy's not there, and he's trying to figure out how... Everything is going to go on at this live stream. It needs to be this big moment. Everything's going to be awesome. But the problem is Cole and Tess and Gemma have decided to not 
put Megan out there. They need to fix the problem, and so Cole and Tess are in there trying to work on her, and Megan not having it. She shuts down their computer. They realize the only way that they're going to be able to work on Megan is if they unplug her from the system to where they can just access the files without her interruption. Cole is very clearly scared to approach Megan. I would have done the same thing. <laughs> because as soon as Cole does unplug Megan, she goes on a rampage, completely breaking physics and everything with the fact that she shouldn't be able to do this because she doesn't weigh more than a grown man. There, there was even a child that picked her up earlier in the movie. Whoops! That doesn't kill him anyway, so then she decides to stab some chemicals and there's an explosion, and now we get this cool scene between her and David. Why she dances? Because she's a child. Then she grabs his paper cutter and starts taking off at David, but she does like the cool Michael Myers killer walk. Never runs, even though David's running the whole time. Pretty great. Stone Cold Killer. And she does. There's a clear difference between the theatrical version here and the unrated version. I can tell you for sure. No! 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 Oh, boo-hoo. You can't get to see the unrated version on YouTube. Oh, no. What was it? You go watch it. Just go watch it. I already told you. You should have already seen it by now. What are you doing? And poor Kurt, who is covered in his boss's blood. Not in the version you get to see. Is then explained to by Megan how all of this is going to be his fault instead of her own. I didn't kill anyone, Kurt. You did. And then the elevator arrives and Megan steps out and I just I just love this scene. I love this lady. I don't know who she is, but she does a perfect reaction here just to go, all right, in three, two, one. Perfect scream, if you ask me. And then Megan's over here still in fancy cars so that way she can go and be with her one and only Katie and I don't know, run away together. I, I don't know what her plan is, and I, I don't think she knows what her actual plan is. But at the very blue house, we get Gemma who seems to feel something is wrong because she looks out the window, doesn't see anything, and then Megan is there playing toy soldiers on the piano. And then they actually seem to have a heart to robot heart as they talk about how whenever Megan was being built by Gemma, they used to spend all this time together, and now they're not even friends. She begins to try to convince Gemma that she was never really meant to be a parent, and that she'll just take over as Katie's primary caregiver. Being a parent was never in the cards for you. And to this, Gemma tries to use the pin move again so she can just manually turn her off and gets slammed to the table. And Katie hears all of this. And after a bit of fighting and trying to convince Katie to go back to bed, she does. And then the water that Katie doesn't put on the coaster comes back into effect and gets thrown right on top of Megan. It's like it's like we're in Sans or something over here. And I'm just like, yes! Because this causes Megan to start glitching and she even like glitch walks. It looked really weird at first, but I'm like, I, I guess that makes sense. And then I found out that this is actually the actress who is doing all of these really neat things. Seven and a half, I'm telling you, pretty impressed. And then to keep Katie from interfering or anything, Megan actually rips the doorknob just completely off. And then the fight continues over into the shop room where Megan gets this awesome new look. But of course the fight is short-lived because Megan is a super smart robot and Gemma's already used up all of her tricks. So Megan begins to explain how she's fixing to paralyze Gemma. This is whenever Katie walks in. And I'll be honest, other than the blue house, this is the other gripe that I had. How did she get out of the room? How do, did she climb out a window? Do you know how a doorknob works? I think I have one. This is the piece that she pulled out. It's got the pin and everything. You have this piece that goes in, and then this one here that just sits. It doesn't move the lock part of the door, so it would just be shut constantly. She could spin this all she wants. She's not getting out of the room, so how did she get out of the room? But anyway, since she's there, Megan says, hey, we can do this together. We can paralyze your aunt or just go ahead and kill her, and then we can run away and just be together forever. Gemma's thinking, Oh no, this is the end for me. Katie says, we forgot to tell you, there's one more member of the family. His name is Bruce. And then she dons the gloves of Bruce. But it's like full on Smackdown, like she's Hulk and Megan is now Loki because she's just slamming her around. And Megan realizes, I don't think I could win this fight. Bruce is really tough. She tries to sing for like the third time in the movie and it, it just really weird. And Katie thinks so too. So she decides to just rip her in too. 
yay, the day is saved, but this is a horror movie, so can't end there. So here comes crawling Megan after Katie, and she's still controlling Bruce, but then Bruce steps on the lower half of Megan, falls over on top of Gemma, and then Megan climbs on top of Katie and says this censored line. You Katie tries to tell Megan to turn off, but then Megan says, I'm afraid it doesn't work anymore. I the new primary user now. Me. Gemma crawls out from underneath Bruce, grabs his head, and begins to smash in the face of Megan. But just before she can rip out the brain of Megan, Megan begins to choke the life out of her. But luckily, Katie also knows where the brain is. And runs a screwdriver straight through it, completely putting an end to Megan. Or so we would think until they walk outside and then Elsie, for some reason, I still don't know if it's her or if it's Megan. I think it's implied that it's supposed to be Megan going, ha I'm still here. You guys go outside to check with the cops and the ambulance about everything. I'm still Megan, but I'm also Elsie. And I'm just like, I don't know what this means. Yeah, I get it. It's a horror movie. She's supposed to not be dead or whatever. But I told you the thing about Kurt, and I think that would be a much better way to tie Megan into the next one, unless this is like the rogue Megan and they're just gonna put out a line and then that's how she gets another body out of everything. I don't, I don't know. I don't know. It was a good movie. If you ask me, it was a good movie. Seven, seven out of ten until, you know, I saw all of these behind the scene things with how she's actually like a full-blown animatronic. It's, it's incredible. It's awesome. If you've seen it, let me know what your thoughts were. How would you score it? If you want me to do another movie, drop it down in the comments and I thank you greatly for watching. Hope you have a extra blessed day, and I'll see you all in the next one.